If I could just draw your attention to some of the information that's flashing up on the, uh, on the screen at the moment. It's the uh, health and safety information. So yes, cloak rooms, I guess everyone knows the, the Geological Society layout, but it's just through the doors at the corner there and to your left. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so welcome everyone to this session of University of Geoscience UK. A um, few years ago we changed the format of these meetings to try to have a discussion meeting or a, a, a session where members had an opportunity to discuss a particular topic ahead of the formal uh, committee meeting, which will be this afternoon. So the topic that was agreed by the uh, committee last year was the future of university geoscience, which is incredibly broad. Um, so today we're going to fo focus on the graduate pipeline. And there are certain drivers to why we've prioritized this. The first is that a year ago, or perhaps slightly over a year ago, we had a town hall meeting jointly run with the Geological Society, focused more towards the research side of the geosciences, and there is a, a, res, a research report that is going to come out of that meeting. It's been delayed, but I'm reliably informed that it is still in progress um, from that meeting, and that will be on the future of geosciences much more with a research perspective in mind. So certainly yesterday in discussing the Geological Society business plan, that was one of the priority areas to get that report finished and published. Discussing the pipeline is also timely because the Geological Society is currently reviewing its accreditation processes and the criteria behind accreditation. So this is an opportunity for us to consider what a a, a, a modern geoscience curriculum should be and the skills associated with that and perhaps feed that back into that process. And then perhaps most importantly out of all of those is that there are real recruitment concerns now that are affecting member departments. Um, you know, I'm aware from some of, the, some of the correspondence from heads of other departments who perhaps aren't here the reason that they're not here is because they're firefighting some of the consequences of the recruitment challenge that, we've, that, we've, um, that we face. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. <clears throat> so let, let's deal with that straight away, recruitment in HE. Well, we know that we are in the middle of a, the midst of a demographic dip. So this is the number of 18 and 19-year-olds that are... Uh, available to us, if you like, in terms of traditional routes of entry into university. Uh, and you can see that the demographic dip is due to reach its minimum in 2020-21. But it, there's a fairly slow recovery back to even the level of um, uh, supply, if you like, uh, of 2017. So some of what we're facing, every part of the sector is facing. Other subjects are facing exactly the same thing. And we can see that that is mirrored in our own application statistics. So the red line there is applications for F6 geology programs. Uh, this, these are the UCAS data, so it doesn't include any direct entries outside of the UCAS system. But you can see this downward trend in applications from a peak in 2014, just over 10,000, to somewhere around about 7,000 at the present time. And the lower line there are how they convert into actual enrolments on university degree courses. And again, you can see that downward trend from that peak in 2014, from somewhere close to 
1,800 in 2014, down to somewhere around about 1,300, 1,400 at the present time. And because of the scale of the graph, that looks better than it is. And I'll expand on that a little bit in, in a moment. Part of the reason it looks better than it is is because if we go back to this as a sector-wide issue, if we look at the physical sciences applications from UCAS, we can see that between 2017 and 2018 entry, there was a, an average decline of around about 6.4% in applications across the physical sciences. And if we look at those broken down by uh, individual subjects, we can see that chemistry was around about that average, physics was bucking the trend and was actually up, but geology was significantly down. It was down more than the uh, sector average. Marine and environmental sciences were sort of bubbling along a little bit, a little bit down. A dramatic decline in physical geography uh, applications, and then the others, again, bubbling along the bottom. So we are, unfortunately, ahead, which means worse than the, uh, the, the sector average in the physical sciences. If we translate that, those data into the membership, so these are individual applications by institution what we see is that this is the change in applications in that same period to member institutions, member departments effectively for F6. And what we can see is everybody is seeing a decline. There are one or two that are bucking the trend, but generally speaking, you're either holding firm or seeing a decline. So this is not something that is isolated to one or two institutions. We're all facing it to a, more, a greater or lesser extent. And if we translate that into enrolments, we can see again, this is the change, so reduction to the left, increase to the right. Some departments are managing to perform better than others, but the vast majority are just about holding their own or seeing a, a decline. And in some cases, significant declines, you know, 30, 40 students down um, in a single year. So a quarter of a million pounds in hard money terms. Uh, and that peak is just to point out that several new departments were receiving applications but did not then enrol students. So that sort of masks a little bit of the, the, the problem there. So this is the change in enrolments on the y-axis. This is the change in applications on the x-axis. And this just highlights the same point, really. Most departments are down here. There's a direct link between reduction in applications and reduction in enrolments. One or two are bucking the trend. I'd like to be in here myself, which is a reduction in applications but an increase in recruitment. So it's a sector-wide issue, but it's a specific issue for the vast majority of the membership of UG UK. So how does this link to the supply of students? And Fortunately, supplied some data by uh, Esther, so Pete, Pete Loder and Chris King, who are in the audience, provided me with some data about trends in uh, A-level and GCSEs. So if we look at A-level entry, we can see that there's been this marked downturn, really dramatic downturn in recent years, to basically the lowest level that it's been, or pretty, pretty much close to and there is no signs that that, is, that decline is going to uh, diminish. So it's going to continue in all likelihood. If we look at it as a percentage of the total entry onto A-levels, we can see that that has been a, a trend over many years now. Okay? It's sort of stabilised in, uh, in the noughties and into the early part where it recovered slightly, up to 2014. We need to think about why that was. Um, but now it's returned to um, a really dramatic decline. It affects 
entry into A-level at all types of institutions, so sixth forms, comprehensive schools with sixth forms, sixth form colleges, they're all showing to, to a more or lesser, greater or lesser extent the same pattern. And it's not just geology, so other subjects are seeing the same decline in terms of entry. So this is environmental sciences. So we're drawing on a smaller pool if we regard geology and environmental science and as, as facilitating subjects for us as uh, university geology departments or geoscience departments. And the same can be said of GCSE geology, so that's also seen a dramatic and progressive decline. Um, and again, we've got that inflection point where the rate of decline has, has increased in l recent years. Most of this is or potentially down to the reform of qualifications and, in, and schools and colleges basically using that as an opportunity to review their provision. Um, and the, the skill set of teachers that are available to deliver the new curriculum. But there may be other factors involved as well. Okay, so let's look at the other side of the equation. So let's think about demand. This is a longer-term view of recruitment to university geoscience um, courses over, well, a 16-year period from 2002. And we can see there's been this steady increase up to 2014, and then this subsequent really rather dramatic decline. And I've been a, an academic for 30 odd, 35 years, and it was always explained to me that, well, when the oil price goes up, recruitment goes up, and when the oil price goes down, recruitment goes down. And they're not perfectly in phase, they're slightly out of phase. And that was always the key argument. So it was a demand-driven um, uh, 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 issue. So the demand was from oil, that was fed by the oil price, Therefore, we adjusted accordingly. So this is the oil price. This is the OPEC oil price over the same period. And, yeah, sure, the boom here in terms of applications does correspond to a peak in the oil price, slightly out of phase. But I'm also pretty sure that that is not a particularly good correlation, be it in phase or out of phase. So, so there is a question about how much this is driven by the demand side of the pipeline and how much is driven by the supply side. So this is the A-level entry curve, and to me that follows a much clearer pattern in terms of reflecting the entry onto university degrees. So in addressing the problem, we have to address both sides of that equation. Sure, we need to understand demand, but we also need to understand the supply, and primarily the supply side <coughs> is A-level, be it A-level geology or facilitating subjects like maths, physics, chemistry. If they're important, clearly they are, then we need to influence that. We need to make sure that the geoscience relevance of that is much more prevalent in, uh, in schools and school thinking. So, too much time on a train with, with, with PowerPoint. Um, so, this is kind of the recent past, 2014. We had buoyant A-level and GCSE um, at schools. We had buoyant A-level recruitment in other facilitating subjects. And we had unprecedented media coverage for geoscience in the late noughties and early part of the the 2010s, um, particularly people like Ian, but not just Ian, there was lots of media exposure for geosciences. So I think that's sort of all weighted on the supply side. And demand, well, we had traditional geo industries, we had the oil industry, booming oil price, but a resurgence in mining. Um, so everything was pretty healthy. But even then, supply was probably outstripping demand. 
So if you look at things like the Wakem Review, it was critical of geosciences in terms of placing geoscience students into geoscience-related employment. It's not to say they weren't doing other graduate-level jobs, but in terms of the demand side, we were probably supplying too many graduates. So that's the but there. There are implications of producing lots of geology graduates if there aren't lots of geology-related jobs out there, or jobs that we can argue draw specifically on a geoscience skill set. So present, well, just flick backwards and forwards, we've got a dwindling supply, so there's much less media coverage, other A-levels are facilitating, it would seem, their own specific subject routes, so physics going into physics, for example, that's what the, the data suggests, and we've seen a dramatic reduction in A-level geology. And at the same time, the geo industry hasn't particularly grown or we haven't recognised the growth in the geo industry and to a certain extent the oil industry has probably declined dramatically. So it's probably much more balanced between supply and demand. It's an uncomfortable position to be in because that's a reduction in the numbers of students on geoscience degrees. We're struggling to recruit. So what about the future? Well, there are various scenarios, and that's what today is all about, really. It's future-gazing, trying to see what the future holds and what we should prioritise to try and influence as, a, as a, an organisation, UG UK. So there are several scenarios that we can imagine. One is that we have continued supply issues, so this continues to dwindle, that we don't return to a popular BBC sort of e evening TV slot, um, that other A-levels prioritise routes into their specific um, degree, degree courses and the continued demise of A-level and GCSE uh, uh, teaching at schools. And, then, and that we regard the demand side pretty much as was. So the extractive industry is the oil industry and we don't adjust in any way to what other demand could be out there for geoscience graduates in which case we're going to continue to struggle to recruit. And I can imagine, it's horrible to say it, some departments going to the wall as a consequence of that. There just won't be enough students to go around. Another possibility is that we manage to influence the supply side. So we lobby hard for A-level geology and GCSEs. We manage to make that some sort of recovery in that that we get people back on the TV, we influence that, we get geoscience much higher in the, in the public psyche so that we kind of recover the, the pool of potential students coming through. And, but again, we're selling it pretty much on the, the, the traditional demand that we, we currently have, so the extractive industries or the ground engineering side of things. In which case, we're almost back to where we were in 2014, potentially. And that has the same but around it, which is... So, OK, we've got more students, but if the demand hasn't changed, we could end up being criticised for producing students that don't have a clear destination. <coughs> so future three is that we somehow influence the demand side as well. So alongside potentially shrinking traditional geo industries, so divestment in oil and gas, for example, we recognise that there are opportunities coming out of that, that the big multinational oil companies are changing their, their business and that there will be and potentially are opportunities for geoscientists in this new space. But we need to know what it is. We need to make sure our curriculum is relevant to that. And it may be accompanied by an increase in supply as well. But basically what we're saying is if we want to get more students through, we have to have a clear recognition of the potential employment outlets for those, for those students as well. So just to summarise, and then I will hand over to Ian. Today and the session after coffee will be facilitated by colleagues from IBM on design thinking. So it's going to be a completely independent group uh, facilitating the discussion and the, the, the breakout sessions. 
and they'll set a particular problem. I, I, I won't say what it is. I'll le leave them to introduce that. But it's basically around what the geoscience curriculum should be if we stop thinking about now and start thinking about 10 years' time. And clearly, we're all in competition. So it's not about saying that everyone has to do the same thing, but it's trying to em emphasise and influence things like accreditation. Is the accreditation, are the accreditation criteria beneficial to us as a series of geoscience departments, or are they actually starting to hamstring us in terms of the, these sorts of, uh, this sort of thinking? So here are some th things to think about. Can we influence the, suit, the future supply of geoscience graduates? So we need to work with Esther. We have had a very good relationship with Esther in the past, and I think it's something that as an organisation we need to make it as a high priority to continue that and to help Esther in any way that, that we can. So that's the Earth Science Teachers Association. To continue to work with the Geological Society. So over the last five years, we've had the Joint Higher Education Committee set up. That is bearing dividends in a common understanding of the issues of the profession and the university's role within the profession. So I, I think that that is um, in place. But as I say, we're going through an accreditation review. How can we influence that without being seen to undermine the whole purpose of accreditation? You know, we can't basically get our own gold stars, we can't define our own gold stars, but I think we do need to influence some of the, the, the approach to the accreditation rather than the content of the, the accreditation. We need to think about how we can improve media and outreach as an organisation. What are the things that we can do as a common group as opposed to individual institutions working completely independently? And, and that applies across a wide range of um, issues, not just media and outreach. So, for example, accessible field work is, is another one. If every department tries to put on a virtual field trip, it's going to cost us a lot of money, whereas if there's a leader in that, we should back it and we should perhaps let the Geological Society take a lead in hosting a virtual field environment, for example, so we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. So a bit more common approach to that. And outreach to facilitating A-level subjects. What's the balance between damaging the supply of A-level geology students, which we don't want to do, and influencing physics and chemistry and maths, biology, because they're also going to supply an important group of students onto our degree courses. I was struck at my daughter's parents' evening last week. I walked down the corridor and it was all earth sciences. Pictures of the earth, da da da, -da. <coughs> And it was in the chemistry department. And it was geochemistry. That's what it, that was the whole purpose of it. And I said, oh, look, you're doing geology. She said, oh, yeah, you got geology. <coughs> And then she rapidly moved through because she knew I'd linger rather too long <laughs> and embarrass her. So. And I just, a cautionary note, really. So it's in a pseudo sort of market economy, it's not a real market because we're so heavily constrained by government policy that it doesn't really work as a free market. But how much should be down to individual departments? Because it is a competitive environment and how much should our organization influence that? What's the balance between the two? Yeah, because clearly we can't make it anti-competitive. That's not the purpose of it. But it's to make sure that there's a healthy supply and a buoyant geoscience sector overall in the UK. So secondly, do we understand the future demand for geoscience graduates? So what's happening in the traditional geo industries? So the extractive industries in which I include oil and gas What's going on there? What are the trends? What, what are their demands? How many, you know, I don't know how many geoscience graduates we supply. In 15 years of being in this role, in various guises, I've never been able to get an answer to that, sector-wide. I know from my own department, but I don't know how many overall geoscience graduates go into the oil industry, how many go into the mining industry, for example. Yeah, we're really data poor in that sense. 
<coughs> Same with ground engineering. So I was at the ground forum representing UG UK last week and I asked the question, so how many graduates do you take on? Because they're constantly telling me that there aren't enough geology graduates for the ground engineering sector. I said, well, we're producing hundreds of them. You know, we've been told that we are failing in getting them jobs, so why do you have a shortage? And they say, oh, well, we take about 800 um, graduates into the ground engineering sector. I said, oh, that's interesting. How did you find that number? And in a follow-up email, because I didn't think about it at the time, I followed up and said, so how did you get to that number of 800? I said, well, I think you told us about five years ago. I said, well, thanks for that. <laughs> so we just don't know. Nobody knows how many graduates go in and why more graduates don't go into the ground engineering sector if there's a shortage. Why aren't they going in? What's happening in academia? We, we've got Brexit, we've got all sorts of changes to the research, funding landscape. So what's going to be the demand for academics and, um, and what's our role at an undergraduate and a postgraduate taught level in providing, supplying uh, the future needs of, of academia? We should be much more in touch with that, I would hope, than perhaps some of the other issues. And what are the future trends? And that's, again, one of the key themes for the meeting. So what is happening to the extractive industries? What are they changing to? You know, oil and gas companies, what are they starting to change to? The energy transition. What are, what are the opportunities for geoscientists as that transition occurs? And who's communicating that back to us? How are we <coughs> informing ourselves of these, these changes? And I guess in that we should include non-geoscience graduate careers as well. So what are the unique skills that geoscientists have? How do we flag those as, you'll only get this if you do a geoscience degree, but guess what? Banks love it, or accountancy firms love it. Yeah, so we need to be better about understanding that. And hopefully the session after coffee will, will help tease some of that out as well. But without making it so generic that we look like, with the greatest respect to any colleagues here who are geographers, make, make geoscience look like, a, look, look like a geography degree. Because there's no point competing in that market. We've got to be distinctive. We've got to recognise what the distinctive elements of our offer are. So what are the gaps in the current geoscience curriculum and how do we know? Yeah, do we teach too much Structural, I'll use structural geology, because that's what I teach. Do we teach too much structural geology, or not enough? Do we teach too much mineralogy, or not enough? Too much crystallography. Accreditation sort of gives us some framework for that. Is it the right framework? So there's been an emphasis on transferable skills. So what makes a geoscience degree the perfect vehicle for, for those transferable skills? Let's be more explicit about that. And something that I've been sort of giving more and more thought to myself, and these are just personal thoughts. You, you know, I'm sure you won't agree with half of them. That's, that's absolutely fine. It's just to really stimulate some of the discussion later through the day. What's the balance between training and education? So field work. Well, we can go out, we can teach students to use a compass kilometre. To me, that's training. Yeah? And every student should be able to do that. So we should be able to say, right, every student who's done a geoscience degree, has been trained to use a compass plot. If they understand what the significance of the data are, that's a different thing. That's education. So understanding the significance of being able to do things. And there's a balance there to be struck between... Tr I, I think of it like... I call it the employability seesaw. So you've got training and education. So things like medicine actually is very heavily weighted towards training. It's competence-based, whereas some subjects art history very much towards education. And we're sort of somewhere in between. We're, we're kind of a balance between the two. You can't become a geologist without doing a geology degree. So there's a training element to that. And then finally, what in the university geoscience curriculum is unique and core to all? So of course every department is going to de develop their own degree and put their own particular flavour and their own stamp on it. What, what is core to all? 
So what educational space do geoscience departments own? So what do all of us say when we're sitting at University Senate and saying, no, 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 you shouldn't close geology because we do these things and they're unique to us. And that's why we're not geography. That's why we're not environmental sciences. Yeah, so what are those core things? And that's often framed in knowledge and skills. So, well, we do geological mapping. And the vice chancellor will go, I don't care. Costs me a lot of money. Or mineralogy or stratigraphy. Quite narrow things that mean a lot to us, but mean absolutely nothing to a vice chancellor. Unless they happen to be a geologist. So are there broader intellectual attributes that encompass all of these things that we could try and communicate to not only the general public but to our internal sort of bean counters? So things like understanding the model in the subsurface in four dimensions. That's what geological mapping is about, at least in part. We map the Earth's surface to make predictions about what's going on in the subsurface. So if we frame it in these sort of broader, higher order intellectual skills, and I think that that could be something that could be usually usefully fed into the accreditation as well. So what is the role of fieldwork? And of course, fieldwork also develops broader personal skills, so transferable skills, self-reliance, independence, all those sorts of things. So another, these are just examples. So another one might be deep time and global change. So nobody else owns deep time. Geologists own that. What does that mean? So it means that we're looking at the evolution of the Earth over huge periods of time. Nobody else does that. But so what? And it's the so what bit that we've got to try and communicate to, to our vice chancellors. Okay, so that's some personal ramblings. Um, it's designed to sort of set the tone, a little bit of background, a little bit of thought about the supply pipeline. Um, for the session, particularly after coffee. But I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to hand over to Ian, who's going to give a, a personal view of the sort of the future direction from, from his own experience over the last year. Do you want to take any Q&A parts? Or do you want to Can we go do it at the end of, of your session? Because uh, we, need, we need the microphone. So that it, I, I should say that everything's being recorded. So uh, keep, keep it... Keep it civil. Mark, will you be able to change, uh, to, to, to uh, share this presentation? Yep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Really good to, to uh, start a discussion in the department itself on this topic. Yeah. Sure. Um, Your yeah, phone's here. Do you need some questions now? I see the microphone's at the back. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was... Are there any questions? I was sure because it might help with my work. I just wanted to say, uh, I thought, um, when you talked about Wakeham, yes. maybe I didn't quite get it, but I, I thought Wakeham's, one of the things about Wakeham that was interesting is geologists are really poor at accessing the market in that first six months when that debut takes place. But ironically, if you looked at the data for 18 months in, geology was back in amongst the same subjects. So there's something peculiar about how the time it takes a geoscientist to enter the market and whether that comes from, you know, whether they've traveled the world or whether it's just a hard not to crack. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But, but even then, when you look at the, de the Delhi data, you know, there's a significant shortfall. For, for a niche area like geology, or, or what's regarded as a niche, niche area, you would think that it would be a higher score still. But you're absolutely right. You know, there's that delay. The, the graduate <coughs> outcome record, which is obviously delayed somewhat relative to Delhi, may, may show an improvement in that. Um, well, it will show an improvement because they're changing the rules, aren't they? They're, they're not doing it after six months anymore. That's right, yeah. Well, we, we hope it will show an improvement, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's fair, it's fair point, but uh, I still think we don't understand quite where our graduates are going, and, well, we may individually, but as a sector we don't, and therefore I'm not sure we engage in quite the right high-level conversations to, uh, to make sure that we're relevant still. It was really interesting to see 
that our intake numbers correlate really very well with the geological A-level numbers in schools. And I believe this is our problem uh, in part because we depend on A-level intakes in schools and schools will chant A-level subjects to make ends meet. So A-level geology will go down further even if geology demand will, will go up. So I believe what we have to really do is we have to reach out to, physic, to physics A-level, to chemistry, to biology, and make sure that they don't project a traditional geology image in the school so much, but say, look, our problems in the next 20, 30 years are environment, our resources, our climate change, our planetary geology, and the earth scientist is at the core of this so we have to recruit from completely different science A-levels in the future. Mm -hmm. And the good news for this is that we all are in the boat together. So we have, to go, we have to go to schools. We have to explain this to them to open this up. And then if I reach a student that goes to a different university, earth science department, fine, we all won. Because if we all do this, we will, we will share in this. So we have to change uh, uh, the view of geology as a very traditional subject into the key subject for the survival of the, of the human race. And I believe this would be really uh, the most important part we, we can do in our roles right now. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I, I think that's an interesting observation. I think it'll be main, maintaining and make, making sure that we nurture geology A-level alongside that, because you know, we don't want to build up one side of the supply chain and destroy the other side. So I think geology will remain, certainly in the foreseeable future, an important, geology A-level, an important contributing <coughs> factor to supply. So. And this is amazing, but only in the UK there is a geology A-level. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, you, you talk about just geology A-level coming into geology degrees. Um, obviously, there's a lot, of, a lot more geography student, A-level students. Uh, what about some of those being attracted into geology degrees? And are we being too narrow in, th in looking at where geologists are going? Because with climate change and all the you know, challenges facing the Earth uh, at the moment, we should be perhaps broadening where the geologists are going. Again, I agree, and I think that that was, perhaps it didn't come across, that was a sense of what I was trying, trying to say, really. But it's knowing how far you broaden it before you become indistinguishable. So you need to keep those sort of core geo unique selling points, if you like, for, from a geology point of view within that. Otherwise, we'll just be subsumed as part of you know, ge geography, effectively. And, and there's a danger there. So there's always been that slight tension I think between the between the two two subjects but absolutely geog the same when I was you know geography a level and that's why I did geology because I didn't like one half of geography you know to put it bluntly I realize the error of my ways now as societal challenges become much more obvious but um, yeah you know I, I agree that, that we need to look after all aspects of the supply chain um, and I think the point is, is that it's geography. The facilitating science subjects, we probably haven't done a very good job with. Just to follow up on that point, there is obviously a, a substantive dip in geography <laughs> graduates yes. as well. So actually 30, minus 30%, I think, so <coughs> somewhat worrying. I guess it, the, the interesting thing from my perspective is you, you mentioned you know, energy futures. Um, that is the area where we really, really have to explore and how we actually try and integrate that into our degree programs is, is really fundamental and perhaps that we need to actually drop the A-level geography, sort of picking up, A-level geology, sorry, picking up on the comments earlier, you know, we might have to drop that and think about actually appealing to a whole range of different individuals. Mm -hmm. I see, you know, anecdotally, people in the oil industry retraining into <laughs> you know, but we're not providing that at an undergraduate level. You know, they're, they're retraining subsequently down their career, upskilling. Perhaps we can offer that upskilling. And that's, that's somewhere where you know, we actually rethink the way we offer geology. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, we, we at Plymouth offered a, an MSc in sustainable geoscience, which was exactly 
trying to target that transition from sort of traditional geologists to, to the new type of geoscientists didn't recruit. <laughs> you know, and that's the problem, that, that unless people see it for what it is, um, and to a certain extent you need to demonstrate that, that, that there's industry relevance there, and that's where the disconnect still remains. So until you've got something that's a tried and tested product, the industry says, yeah, we like those graduates. It's actually quite difficult to sell it to somebody. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with that. You know, we've at Keele, they tried a geoscience degree and that just didn't recruit, which was quite remarkable, even though it's because it's just not a geology degree, yeah. which was really trying. Thank you. OK, uh, Amanda. Yeah, so one last comment. Um, in Sorry, Scotland, uh, speak, otherwise you won't be picked in up. Scotland, we've noticed with, uh, Wait for the mic. Sorry, um, in Scotland we've noticed that A-level geology is pretty much non-existent now in most of the Scottish schools. And when we've been talking to geography teachers, a lot of them are actually from humanities backgrounds, so therefore even struggling to teach the physical side of things. So I'm wondering if that's an area that we as a sector really have to help provide the tools, just like you have like Carlton um, website where you can go in and basically take practicals, whether we need to do that to make sure that we are still engaging those students and helping people from humanities backgrounds teach those physical earth science side of things? Yeah, I, I'd agree, and I think um, there's been some progress in, in that. Um, Pete, I don't know whether you want to say anything. But. Yes, okay. you can hear. That. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, th there is no geology in Scotland, and um, there are some people in Scotland. However, there are two centres in Scotland who are who are doing geology at the moment, and they're doing it through uh, rather than doing it through the Scottish system, they're doing it through the English system. So they really broken away. And it's interesting that uh, one of those people and the, the sort of key person in that was trained at Keel, because that's one of the other things that, I mean, Chris may uh, say a little bit more about this, that if you're not pr producing geology teachers, then the subject's going to die out because there are too many people, geology teachers, desperately enthusiastic, but they're all my age and Chris's age. And, uh, you know, there are some new people coming through and eight people, Chris, uh, we do you want to say something about the, uh, the training? Well, the, the problem in Scotland, uh, why the hire has disappeared, is not because there wasn't a demand in Scottish schools. It was because the last um, Scottish uh, geology teacher was trained in 1966. And so gradually, over time, they faded away and, uh, and died. And so, so did the SQA hire. And so the, 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 the good news is that some of those Scottish people are now coming to this uh, summer school we run at Keel to train geology teachers, and they've gone back to Scotland and they've started up d doing A-level. So there are things we can do, but uh, it's, uh, it's th the whole, as, as you heard from Mark, the whole situation across the country is difficult, and it's not to do with us, it's to do with the government changes, and that's a very difficult thing to grapple with and th that we need to discuss further about, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. I'm aware of uh, the time and that already off track. Um, so I'm, I'll hand over to Ian and there'll be an opportunity for further questions. And these are exactly the sorts of discussions that we hope will occur in the breakout groups uh, after coffee. So over to you, Ian. <coughs> thanks, Mark. I'm going to... <coughs> oh my God, where's, where's this come from? Um, I'm going to try and I'll catch up a little bit of time, I think, because um, I've not got a formal presentation. I started doing my, I started doing my PowerPoint over the weekend and the last few days, and I realized it was this boring talk that I'd ever <laughs> prepared, and so I thought it was easier just to... Um, me, that's me. <laughs> well, it's kind of the figures, you know, are, you know, when you see the raw figures, um, it is kind of depressing, and I think that... What I thought I would do is, um, and the reason why Mark kind of set me up for this fall here, which is to stand in front of lots of people who spend all the time thinking of the future of geoscience, for me to say what my view of the future of geoscience is, meant that that's an impossible task. But the reason it came about is because over the last year, I've, or the last six months really, I've been to uh, three major conferences, and there's another one coming up in March, which is essentially the future of geoscience, one way or another. 
And it is interesting that these are international conferences where they're talking about the future of geoscience. Um, there hasn't been a single one at the Jolstock. The last one in the future of geoscience was about research. Um, these are all industry-led. And that's an interesting point. Industry is worried about the future of geoscience from their sector, which is telling you straight away that it's actually not something that's just in the schools and feeding through. It's coming, in the other, it's coming from the other side. And um, so those, and another point that I would say is yes, we've got a demographic depth and all the rest of it, but this is an issue that is beyond the UK. So uh, uh, one of the, so for example, in Norway, two, four years ago, the number of people got into oil-related master's courses, 240. Last year, 40. I got the figures just came through this morning. I'd ask because at one of the conferences, someone had talked about how it was, the bottom was falling out of the market in uh, Holland. So this is someone saying, uh, technical of sciences at bachelor at Technical University of Delft. Uh, 2017, there was uh, 87. Last year, there's 47. Uh, masters had been reduced by 50, the masters courses, especially for interest in petroleum related geoscience, 50% down. Um, in Amsterdam, the Freie University of Sciences were around 55 uh, students versus eight, 70 to 80 uh, the year before. So this isn't a UK uh, <coughs> phenomenon. This is a, a, a global phenomenon, I think, because also, so the conferences that I went to, uh, you know, the, in, and some of you were at these ones, the Resource and Future Generations uh, Conference in Vancouver in July, the IUGS organized which was the largely mining sector, uh, looking at the big issues affecting the resource sector more broadly, some energy there. Then the uh, AAPG two-day forum, which is called the Energy Transition Forum, um, which referred itself as the new era in geoscience, which was, again, looking at the, what is the role of the geoscientists, and we've heard, heard the energy transition. And then more recently in October was the Australian Geoscience Council's big congress, um, where a whole day was related to big issues and big ideas, and a big fundamental part of that was the future and what's coming. And then the, the fourth one, ironically, isn't been yet, but it's the big AGU conference on geology for public good, which is getting held in Stockholm, and which are kind of involved in some of the priests. So the um, kind of organization, et cetera. So these are global fora that are worried about the future of geoscience. And the message, and what I thought I'd do is, is, is talk about what was, the, what was getting the, discussed by the end part of the pipeline, the industry that's reliant on us. What are they talking about? And what are they expecting from us? Because quite interesting <laughs> sometimes they what they think is happening in academia and what they think some of the, the, the roles are. So, so one of the, the general points is that we are at a fundamental change in that global uh, setup. And I think um, the, the, the point that I wanted to make right up front is something about positivism, because there's a lot of negativism that's going to be coming through. And, and I'm just going, this is the, one of the statements that came out of, as a result of the APG one. And I thought, I really want to keep this close to where we're going. So it says, we're witnessing and can contribute to the deepest, most far-reaching, and fastest transition of humankind. This is happening because of us and produced by us. So this it, it is one of the things that is coming through in all these meetings. This is the most dramatic and exciting time to happen. The pace of change environmentally in the human and societal system is immense. So it's an amazing time to be someone relating to the planet and things like that. So why is it? Even more so, why is it that we're seeing these, these numbers? What the view from industry is that we've not been selling geoscience properly. Not us, but the whole thing. The, the industrial sector as well. Mining the flagellates itself and not being able to be able to convince. Petroleum also thinks that it's now seen as in a, in a really dire situation. And they're kind of looking to academia to sell the importance of these industries in these futures, these futures about climate change, about sustainable development. And, and they're struggling to do it at their end, and they're looking to us to, to do it at our end, and we're presumably looking down the road into the schools to do it at that end. No one really seems to be able to connect this through. So I thought that I would just mention, and I'll do this a little bit faster than I was thinking, but I'll try and mention some, I think, what the key highlights are. 
So the main notion is that, first of all, we're in this dramatic uh, transition. What are the, the kind of drivers for this? What we know is that there is a huge changes that, that's coming in terms of, you know, the, the demand side, in terms of demand of resources and energy, that's only going up, you know, world population uh, kind of rising, the growth of uh, cities uh, and all the rest of it. So, you know, by 2040, 75% of the population living in cities, India, China, Africa is leading the demand growth, and, and all of that is going to rise for an increased demand in energy, but a much more diverse energy mix, and an increased demand on resources. So, and, and an increased demand on the kind of ground engineering and construction. All the things that we would see as sitting near our core are on the up. So again, why is it that we're struggling apparently for uh, perception and also for, for kind of real numbers? Um, <coughs> there's an absolute issue around this transition between what has been our traditional energy source, so fossil fuel stuff that we've, many of our courses are kind of tied into, and the new stuff. So we, you know, we know that coal is going to kind of peak demand. I, uh, you know, it's going to be expected to peak really in the next decade. Oil and gas are talking about uh, peaking in the next two decades, not, and, and that peak won't be from lack of oil. That is because of the shift across to electric, and that's going to be driven by gas. So gas is going to be increased into 2050, 2060, and maybe will peak. So fossil fuels aren't going away, but they're going to change the nature of that. And, you know, I'm conscious that Mike's just written a whole book on this, so I'm going to get off of this subject really fast. The, the big thing is the change to switch across to electrification and electric vehicles, and the driving renewables. And renewables now suddenly, without subsidy, are undercutting um, uh, uh, fossil fuel stuff that's coming on stream, and I think in 2030 20, will actually undercut existing um, fossil fuel stuff. So the writing's on the wall about the trajectory, the roadmap for energy. It's a renewable future where we're going to have to, um, the fossil fuel, the traditional one, is going to e ease out, and we're going to move this new one in. So the question in some of those ones is, what's the role of a geologist in the solar industry and in the wind industry? So Total, for example, by 2021, needs 21, it's going to have 21% of its assets to be renewable energy. So if you join Total as a geoscientist, you're as likely to be in their wind division or the solar division as in to be in their oil and gas division. So what is the fundamental skills of a geoscientist in the solar? And, and can we do that? What are we teaching them that's actually going to allow them to do that side of things? Now, the industry think we're amazing. Because one of the things that comes through is to say, well, geologists have this really diverse skill set. So they can move across the value chain, the supply chain. We can get them in the commercial side. Then we can move them. And you think, OK. But what, what is it they think we've got that allows us to move right across all those different sectors? Because I still see students want to go into, if they want to go into oil and gas because of their second year sedimentology or their, their structural geology or something like that. And that what is the role? Is it just going to be site investigations to place offshore you know, turbines? One of the things that's pointed out is the fact that, well, maybe actually what the oil and gas can do is it can move into these sectors like offshore wind um, because it has the culture. So one of the things it says is oil and gas is created, for example, this really good safety culture. And that's what's going to be needed in these new environments. Um, and again, and we could say, well, actually, we, we have in, inculcated a really strong uh, health and safety when we do field work and things like that. So it's one of the things about being a geoscientist is that you risk very good awareness of, of risk and safety. Now, that's certainly not the way we sell field work. But actually, maybe fieldwork is actually as much about getting those skills that are, that if that's going to be valued in industry, it's going to be us graduates saying, we are really good on health and safety. And actually, that's a good thing. Most students, I would say, would never put that in their CV because they think it's just tediously boring. But for companies, that's really high up their, their kind of priorities. So there's a whole load of, of kind of big macroeconomic factors driving uh, this change. It's not going away, as, long, as well as renewables. I think there's two things that they are, particularly oil and gas, are looking to to solve, solve, to have their salvation. One of them is carbon capture storage, and what I mean by that is no one really kind of believes it, but but the notion that carbon capture storage is is a technical um, cap capability we have now, 
And it's one of the things that's obviously highlighted has been important for climate change and climate change mitigation. But the fact is no one gets excited about, climate, about carbon capture storage. You know, the, the climate change side don't, the oil industry don't. But it is one of the bits of the <coughs> conventional today's oil and gas that can be seen as a future thing. So at the, um, the Amsterdam Forum, the first speaker at, at this oil and gas summit was, was Christiana Figueres. And Christiana Figueres was the main negotiator, the architect of the climate change agreement in Paris. Now, she gave both barrels to a room full of oil and gas. But her main message was, we need you as an industry to come on board and really make the change. One of the things was to be getting involved in a lot of these big issues around climate, not firefighting about whether it's happening and all this, get, getting on board and also moving towards sustainable development issues, but also to bring in climate change mitigation issues in the longer term. And, that, and the other kind of bridge that the oil and gas particularly uses is geothermal. Again, that's seen as really close to home. It's oil and gas technology and it's good. It's green energy and it allows us to kind of transition. And actually you're seeing geothermal now rising up the agenda across the UK, but also across Europe and across, uh, across the world, because it can give that low enthalpy heat, ground heat, which can help us with the, the heat issue of the energy, but also because it actually can be electricity generation. So we're involved with the, the deep geothermal project down in, in the southwest in Cornwall. Um, but across the world, really, people are seeing geothermal as a place where geologists can hold their hands up and go, see, we are actually making a difference to this new energy world. Um, I wonder how many courses we have that has got geothermal in them in a significant way. How many energy courses? It's more than one lecture. I mean, in places at Durham, I'm sure, I've got a lot because of the nature of people there. But I don't think we at Plymouth, I don't think we have a lecture on geothermal. So, so even, even kind of a, the heartland of geothermal, I uh, think. Um, and I think this notion of, uh, you know, how, how we sell ourselves is going to be, I guess, my main message. I, I think that geoscience is selling itself very poorly. And digressing just a little bit from this, I mean, um, Mark mentioned media. What was interesting when, in the early 90s, you know, after uh, Aubrey Manning, bless him, that, died last week it, with our story in 1998, I think it was. You know, that really kicks us in a, this discovery by kind of the public of geoscience that really captures the imagination. And, it, you know, we've run it for 15 years, but now people kind of know about it. It's not exciting and new anymore. Um, but there was that sense of unfamiliarity that drove a lot of this, this thing. And many, maybe we've been too good at now getting it out so that everyone kind of knows a little bit about it. But we've, they've lost us a disenchantment about geoscience that's out there. And I think one of the reasons, maybe our responsibility, is we've done it in quite a functional way. Kind of said what it's good for. It's like castor oil. Swallow it, it should be good for you. You know, you need some geoscience, it's just good for you. We haven't gone out to really say why it is that it's really important. Um, so as I say, on the big, there's a big sense within um, oil and gas, and, and I take the point, actually, but, but this, we're too narrow maybe in these, these sectors, because, um, the, the oil and gas and the mining are, are, are places where certainly our graduates go, but actually most of our graduates go to the environmental science, environmental and consultancy. They're knee deep in contaminated land six months after they've done their, their geology. We never we don't teach them anything on contaminated land. That's where a lot of the jobs are. It's in construction, it's in things like that, certainly in the UK. And that's not, a, that's not a sector we feel we can really sell very well at first year. Everyone wants to study dinosaurs and volcanoes and studying a quarry with aggregate doesn't seem to really do it. So I think we've got a, a kind of an issue there. Um, so I, th I think that there's, there's no doubt, in terms of some of these traditional ones, they're not going away. You know, we're going to need geoscientists for oil and gas for you know, at least to 2050, kind of 2060. There's going to be this, with the renewables, as we all know, a demand for new types of minerals. So some of the oil and gas companies that are, for example, in what, Texas are looking at the, their, their, um, their hydrocarbon waters because they're actually thinking that maybe they can make more money out of getting the minerals out of those hydrocarbon uh, waters than actually um, the, the oil and gas themselves. So the, one of the big interests down in the southwest is the lithium from the geothermal waters. We're actually starting to mix these sectors. What is mining and what is oil and gas, for example, around this? 
And again, that's a, a, an issue because we still have courses that are maybe economic geology, petroleum geology. But we're, you know, is that a real? Uh, a lot of these companies are oil and gas companies have become energy companies, which become resource companies. So you know, we need to kind of think about that a little bit. Um, so the other thing uh, they, they absolutely notice, and one of the reasons why that that fluctuating uh, kind of oil price doesn't work is the societal changes that are coming in. So for oil and gas, you know, these are external, these are geopolitical changes around climate change regulations. And to be honest, around a change in society that is thinking about sustainability and environmental issues much more <coughs> acutely. So the, the students that are coming in are much more environmentally aware than they were 10, 15 years ago, without a doubt. And they're demanding a lot more. And I'll come back to sustainability later on, but in this room, uh, the, every year they hold the Geology for Sustainable Development. I don't know if anyone's gone to that. I, didn't, I missed it this year, but the last previous year. This room has been full of, uh, generally these are graduates, final year graduates, kind of postgraduates. And the interesting thing, 80% female sitting in that, this, this kind of room. A completely different demographic that's interested in these issues. So to what extent are they getting then that when they come through their undergraduate in what geology is, if we're still going on about oil and gas and mining and engineering? So that's part of the thing is the whole face of geoscience is changing, and I think academia is behind the curve, and the traditional industries are recognizing that they're behind the curve. Um, so I've got a quote here from, so here's some of the summaries that came out of, uh, of some of these general books. So, so we're transitioning to a low carbon world. That's good news, that's really good. You know, we, we are losing the kind of traditional sectors, and that makes us nervous, but that should be a good news story that we're actually uh, kind of pushing. It's good news for the planet. It's that energy transition is not going backwards, it's irreversible. And, and the question is, how does our traditional sector, oil and gas, mining, engineering, where do they function in this new world that's coming? And they don't know out there, and we don't know here. So we are in this situation where they've, the people we're supplying aren't quite sure of the future. We're not sure of the future. And I'm sure down in education, because of that, they're not quite sure of the future as well. So someone needs to start having a kind of joined together kind of vision of how this, this thing might work. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about the nature of the change, the magnitude of the change, the pace of huge uncertainty. Um, and there's not a single story. Uh, the, it's going to be something that's geographically very different. The story in the UK about how we develop will be different from other parts of Europe, will be different for developing countries, different for the USA. That's because of the kind of a lot of the policies that comes in and also the different publics. Um, so this is a quote from the VP, Vice President of Exploration, Max Brows at Shell. He says, in the face of huge opportunities and uncertainties we face, geoscientists need a suitcase full of skills to be ready to travel, not just geographically, but cross disciplines and across the value chain. So again, when we're thinking of skills, I still think that often, and certainly our undergraduates do, that we're thinking of your second year petrology and the ability to use a stereo net, and that, that's what they're seeing. That's not what Max is talking about. He's talking about these transferable skills that we're really still not quite sure. We've got a sense of, but we're not really sure what they are. I want to focus just on the time I've got is two, two areas that I think are really coming on and dominated conversations in several of these. Digitalization, the first thing, big data. No one knows what the hell it is, but we know it's important. So what's coming on, artificial intelligence. Uh, you know that thing about, uh, big data is like teenage sex. I can't remember how it goes. It's something like, you know, no one really knows what it is. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, and you're pretty sure you're not doing it. Um, but it's true. This is sweeping through the other sectors, and it hasn't really swept through geoscience. But it is, the oil and gas, are really interested in it. So this is big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Mining is getting into it strongly because a lot of the, the kind of rather mundane task, it also relates to health and safety, can it be done automated? So this is really sweeping in and there's a lot of discussion now about what is the role of the geoscientist in this new place of that's de completely dominated by digital and by um, computer systems and people relating to it. So some of the general points was, it will transform the workplace in, uh, in all of these environments. Most of the tasks will be done in an automated style. 
what, would, what was still needed is QA. QA of the quality of data going in and the quality of data coming out. And that will still be the role of the geoscientist. So it's not going to take geoscientist jobs away. Funnily enough, there's going to be the need for this person that can oversee lots of this and be smart enough to deal with the, the data and also understand the context of the data interpretation. But they're saying that what we're going to, those geoscientists are going to need to understand big data, understand how to interface. You'll probably be in a remote team where your other members of your team will be somewhere else, and at least some members of those team will be a computer feeding you data. And that will be your working team. So understanding and being familiar with big data and artificial intelligence and machine learning will be part and parcel of what a geoscientist is expected to kind of have in that toolkit. So there'll be very specialist people, deep dive people, who will be the programmers and the coders and all the rest of it. And that's not where we are. But the expectation is the geoscientists will be this kind of in broad disciplinary one that can converse with that, but actually has another skill set too. Um, so the expectation then is that all of our courses will need to have stuff with big data and machine learning at some point, some exposure to this. And, and that is an expectation that industry has because they're having to reskill all of their people in this. So uh, uh, the Australian conference, the talk from Jill Terry, who's head chief geologist at BHP Billiton, 45 minutes talking about the future of geoscience, 35 minutes talking about big data and, and, and machine learning and all the rest of it. The last 10 minutes talking about the role of geoscientists, and that was her point. That actually, we don't want geoscientists to become programmers and all that stuff. That's gonna be, almost all of that's gonna be done automated anyway. We need them to be engaging with it. And she's gonna to have to turn around her BHP skills uh, workforce in five years max to this new world. She said, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And someone mentioned CPD in course in training. She's looking at universities to two things, to be helping train that, that thing. And also the pipeline of stuff coming through means that we should be helping this new set generation one to have those skill set when they come in. Um, so that's one of the things when the, the APG meeting, we finished with a final session with the young professionals, so the young, young ones, um, uh, just before we did the design thinking one. And they were saying, uh, you know, the thing about the young ones is that they are digital. They're digital natives. They're very comfortable with that digital world. It's us that's not. So they're really comfortable, and they're demanding that this data set. I mean, you might be just, I mean, big data, it must be a massive thing now in, in big data. Yeah. And so I think, you know, to the extent to which the universities are following on from that or embedding it is a, is a real question. The other one's the absolute opposite. And that is a lot of the conferences, particularly the mining one, it was about social license and how we reach people in communities. Um, and so there's a real recognition that, uh, particularly in mining, but also we're seeing it with the shale gas, obviously, not, so not so much offshore oil and gas, but the onshore oil and gas anywhere, but if it's the UK, it would be the, the shale gas thing particularly, is that the technical stuff is always getting screwed up by our inability to communicate what we know to uh, to policymakers, to politicians, to publics, to communities. And there has always been a sense that if we just train ourselves to think, to communicate better, to communicate the science clearer, to not use jargon, to have images that are clearer, then somehow the people would go, oh, that's what you mean. Right, I get it now. I understand. Yeah, do whatever you want. We know that's not true. That's not the way it works that we have to engage long-term dialogues with communities. And this is an issue that's come up. So 2015, three global frameworks come into being. The uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. All of those have got lots of science and technology built into them about using data. But they all, the other thing they all have is that communities and the publics need to be more involved in the process of these changes that are affecting them. <coughs> so if you write a European grant now, it's all about responsible research and innovation, RRI. So the society signing off that they like the things that we're, idea, we're doing. So you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's geothermal or, or mining or whatever it is. How do you engage with communities? What do we teach our undergraduate? What are, what, where's the skill set that we generally do about that? So even in Plymouth, we put on a science communication course in fourth year. But it actually doesn't do end about community and stakeholder engagement. We just kind of get to assume that these people will be good at this kind of stuff. So these are two different things. One is technology and remoteness and all this high-tech stuff, and the other one is getting close, up close and personal with communities to be able to, to do that. 
Those are two skill sets that the, the industry are thinking that are absolutely critical to them as they go forward. How can they explain themselves to people who are non-technical and that they understand how can they use this really multidisciplinary kind of polymorphic kind of skill set world that is coming. And I don't really think we've brought them in. And, and just to finish then, it seems to me uh, that one of the key things is we're not selling ourselves. And that's certainly what the, the industry has said. Help us sell how critical geoscience says to solving many of these big issues. So I do think that geoscience has got critical roles to play in sustainable development, in addressing climate change, in addressing disaster risk reduction. I don't think it's what we teach them at the moment, because we teach them the technical skills, but we don't teach them the transferable skills to get that over the line to actually make change, effective change. And how we do that, I, you know, lots and lots of ideas. <laughs> but I think the way we sell it is, is problematic. It seems to me that if you think of a market, and I, some people have heard me talking about this before, but if you, there's three marketing paradigms, right? Uh, so if we think we're in the selling business, what are those paradigms? Number one, the traditional long-term marketing paradigm for, is the make and sell approach. So that looks at your production line process, and you get your production line in as most efficiently as you can. You think about your raw materials and all of that. You get that very efficient. You get a product. And you've already decided the product is something the public want, you, and you sell it. You've got a sales force, and they've got to sell it. I think a lot of what we do in geoscience in relation to public and policy is make and sell. We do what we want, we tell them it's important, and then we say, you should buy this, because we're really good. The, the flip side that comes in in the 1950s is true marketing, but it says, no, forget that. It's the customer that's important. Think about what the customer wants. So the customer for us, one way is students, the customer for us, the other way is industry. And we just say, what do you, what do you, it's called sense and respond. What do you want? Oh, OK, we'll do that. We'll bring this. Up. What do you, the problem with that is it's very reactionary and it's short term. And that doesn't really tackle some of these issues that are 15, 20, 30 years in the future, climate change and the resource challenges and all of this. But, but the third way, I think, is quite interesting, and it's a model we could look at. And, and it's come from these companies like... Uh, Unilever and kind of lush and innocent, which have got large amounts of social value and a, and a customer base. It says it's called guide and co-create. The guide bit says we have a sense of a long-term trajectory. We think we know where this world's going. But co-create says we need to work with you, the customer, the student or the industry, to get to that final goal. And it might end up being different, because we'll end up in this journey together and we'll kind of do that. But it has a responsibility on us for that long-sightedness, and then a, an ability to connect in to our customer base that's very kind of intimate. And I think the, the thing there is, actually the internal production process doesn't matter. The content we do is kind of determined by the long-term goal and by what the customer is wanting. Because we can kind of teach anything within the geoscience. It's a case of what's relevant for who we want to kind of supply. So this notion that we are we are the kind of um, guardians of geoscience, of what it is to be a geologist, handed down from generations of geologists, and whether we should keep that is, is not relevant. Hutton, in 1783, in his theory there, says, this world is a habitable world, and on the wisdom of its formation we must depend. In other words, we study the formation of the Earth because we're living in an inhabitable world and we need to maintain that. That doesn't seem to me too different from looking at sustainability and looking for a sustainable future, and that is a job of geoscience as a community to, to deliver that. So I've gone over, um, but I think, I think the point is to seed and <laughs> provoke for, for this bit after coffee. So what we're going to get after coffee is, as I said, we, this... Design thinking, IBM have really kind of pushed this. So Shell and a lot of the majors use the design thinking for their internal kind of purposes of where they're going and all the rest of it. They work really effectively in Amsterdam. And so the idea is bringing the same team in for us to start thinking about how we might do it. And I'll just make a general point. I think it works on two levels. So I think this fundamental strategic visioning is a good level. But the other thing is much more prosaic, which is I think it's a really good way to do teamwork. And we know how much our students hate doing group work and teamwork. And so actually, to be able to say, this is how Shell do it. This is how the majors do it. And, and so we, you might find it useful in that context as well. So I better stop there. Thanks very much. That's great. Thanks, Ian. Um, I 
I never thought I'd hear teenage sex in these august offices. But, uh, <laughs> I did as well, for posterity. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're running slightly over. Um, perhaps if we leave questions for now, I'm sure that's promoted quite a lot of thought and uh, there will be questions. But perhaps you can explore those in the breakout groups uh, after coffee. We're going to leave you in the hands of our colleagues from IBM. Um, and we'll obviously join breakout groups, but they're going to drive the session. All we've said is what we would like is to address a particular problem, which is about the geoscience curriculum, not about writing a geoscience curriculum. You know, th this isn't the right group for that. Um, it's about how we influence the geoscience curriculum. What is it that we as a, a, an organisation need to be getting over the next year, I guess, what are our priorities in terms of helping inform the development of a, a, a revised geoscience curriculum? So that's the problem that, that we've asked them to, to tackle, and they will lead us through a process, hopefully at the end of which we will have the big issues identified, and then this afternoon we can sit in the committee environment and discuss which of those we're going to prioritise and how to action them. Because that's the, the thinking. Um, it's time to grab a coffee. Chris, you wanted to say something about Geo Week. Can we do that at the beginning of the lunch break? Will that be okay? Great, thanks. Okay, coffee's in the library. Thank you. Oh, wow, that's a good point. I think that's you, isn't it? Excellent. Well, it's just to get it going, isn't it? I mean, that's the... Yeah.